Moving on, we've been looking at associative learning with classical conditioning and operant conditioning. With operant conditioning, you can do all kinds of things, and there's been lots of applications where um, we've actually trained rats to sniff out mines because they're not heavy enough to trip the mines, but their sense of smell is so good. There's been lots of things that we've done, but there are constraints on conditioning, and they go along the biopsychosocial the three levels of analysis thing. First of all, there's a guy named John Garcia that really questioned the idea, you know, that any stimulus can take the substitution um, for a for an unconditioned stimulus. And he did it because he was doing experiments with rats and he was uh, giving them small doses of radiation, which would make them nauseated and sick. Um, and he noticed after a time that these animals began to um, dislike the plastic water bottles so he wondered you know was it the taste or the water bottle that was was causing this so he did some experiments and basically the bottom line is what he showed is that our conditioning usually leads to the more natural kind of stimuluses that happen it was actually the taste that the rats became averse to um this was counter to the to the original beliefs because now what we've found this is a case where even hours after administering uh, the water that the rats would develop the aversion to the taste and if you think of yourself you know when you have food poisoning and i'm sure many of you had um sometimes you don't get sick for hours uh after but you associate it with that food and it's the taste of the food you become averse to, not the sight of the restaurant or the sound of the music um, that's around there, but it's actually that taste and you probably don't like it. Uh, we have secondary conditioning too, where a lot of times we don't like the taste of, of things that remind us of things that are repulsive, uh, foods that are slimy we tend to dislike. Um, in one experiment uh they took uh, i can't remember what it was it was chocolate balls or fudge or something and they made some you know into like regular fudge squares and some they shaped like dog poop and guess which ones people avoided it was the ones with dog poop okay so we have genetic predispositions of what is easier to to um allow ourselves to be conditioned to uh the picture down at the bottom they used it was uh coyotes and, and wolves were attacking sheep so what they did is put a chemical in some sheep carcasses that the animals ate and they actually became repulsed at the taste of it and actually showed some fear of sheep so this was a great application because it helped save the wildlife and it stopped the sheep from being attacked you know other limits it, it is adaptive but here's a situation when we have you know a chemotherapy patient going through enough as it is as a cancer patient um but a drug, their chemotherapy, is an unconditioned stimulus to nausea, okay, which is the unconditioned response. So when they're sitting in a waiting room, they can start to associate just being in the waiting room with receiving the drug and the nausea. Now, in this case, it is not uh, biologically sound for them because it's actually helping them. But after a while, the conditioned stimulus could become the waiting room. So they start to feel nauseated just by that or things that they associate with it. So it's not exactly um, survival inducing in this case. With operant conditioning, um, you know, we believe that you could, you could teach an animal almost anything through operant conditioning, any behavior it's possible of eliciting. But what we find is those behaviors that go against its nature have what we call an instinctive drift and eventually they go back to their natural behavior okay so it's not um, the things that are closer to its natural instincts are much more easy to condition also in in classical conditioning um, there becomes a predictability of an event um, and there's there's cognitive aspects of it that may have been you know not paid attention to by skinner and watson or ignored i think they acknowledge them especially near the end but for example, we would give a, an alcoholic as a, a way to make them dislike the taste of their favorite alcohol. We give them their favorite drink. We put a drug in there that actually makes them feel nauseated. So they develop an aversion to that taste. However, it doesn't take as much because cognitively they know it's actually the drug inside the alcohol that causes the nausea nauseum So it's not necessarily the taste of the drink that's causing it. So it doesn't take as a big as effect as it would have um, and of course always extinction will occur later on and so it's not a treatment but it may be a way to help detox 
We also have, you know, as far as cognitive learning, we have latent learning. Latent learning is when you learn something and you're not even really aware that you've learned it until you need to use it. Uh, for example, you're driving around a, a town and you're not really paying attention. Someone asks you where to go. You couldn't tell them how to get to that location, but you could find it on your own when you had to. Um, we know we call this a cognitive map. We learned this with rats. Um, we, we show rats a maze with no reinforcement. And then we would compare the time that they would go through the maze to get to food to rats that had never seen the maze. And they would consistently do it faster, like they developed this cognitive map and they just played latent learning when they were motivated to go get the food. Insight learning, you've, all of us have experienced. This is the, the time when you get this sudden realization to a problem. There's like an aha moment. And it, sometimes it takes like 0 0.03 seconds from the time of not knowing it to knowing it. And it's like your brain figures it out. And then all of a sudden you get it. It's that, that aha moment, that insightful learning. And we've seen this displayed by animals um, in several experiments. And, you know, hopefully you'll look in your book and also we'll try to bring some of those up in class. The motivation one has, um, you know, ask yourself, why are you taking an AP class? Why are you taking AP psychology? Um, if it's intrinsic motivation, it's because you're very interested in the subject and you want to learn more about it because it's enjoyable for you. If the extrinsic motivation part of it is that, you know, I'm doing it because I want to progress my career. I want to get good grades. I want to get into university and be successful. Those are, you know, or get, uh, you know, get my A's, my 4.0 GPA. That's all extrinsic kinds of motivation. And you probably have both when you're in an AP psychology class. What's interesting is people that are intrinsically motivated to do something, it, we find it more motivating than intrinsic rewards. And when you are intrinsically motivated to do something that you just for the sheer enjoyment of doing it, when we start to extrinsically reward you for that, the motivation shifts and actually it lessens. Um, when we have, you know, children in school and they love to paint, for example, and we start reinforcing or rewarding those that have, um, you know, after they paint, we find that they like painting less than the ones that were just left on their own to continue painting. You know, and you think of other applications that, you know, professional athletes or, or anything that you do that you start getting paid for. And it's something, you know, that we want to keep that intrinsic motivation because that's what's most enjoyable for us. So the influences on conditioning, we have biological and cognitive processes in both classical and operant. In classical, the biological predisposition dispositions is that natural predispositions constrain what stimuli and responses can be easily associated. The cognitive process is organisms, you develop an expectation that the conditioned stimulus signals the arrival of the unconditioned stimulus. In operant conditioning, biologically, organisms best learn behaviors similar to their natural behaviors. Unnatural behaviors instinctively drift back towards the natural. Okay, the cognitive processes is we develop expectations that a response will be reinforced or punished. Okay, they also exhibit latent learning without reinforcement. So there's learning going on without, you know, what happens immediately afterwards. Uh, which leads to learning and personal control. Coping is, you know, how we deal with issues. And there's problem-focused coping and emotion-focused coping. Problem-focused coping is dealing with the problem. So for example, you have a family member and you're getting into a fight and you're not getting along. So you go to that person, you talk it out, that can, you're addressing the problem directly. Now, emotion focused coping may come when we feel like we are unable to deal with that problem. So we deal with our emotions. We look for support from our friends and deal with how we feel about that situation. Learned helplessness is a term Martin Seligman came up with. And what this is, is when we have an adverse uh, situation that continuously happens, we feel we have no control of it. We, we tend to end up with a passive resignation to it. Um, this can happen with animals as well. You know, dogs that are beaten all the time, you can just sense on them that they've, they've given up. Okay. They have a learned helplessness. Just this is going to happen and there's nothing I can do about it. So when we look at a locus of control, what we're saying is people with external locuses of control believe that no matter what they do, they have no say in how a situation is going to thing or how things turn out. It's just all kind of predetermined in a way that it's going to happen that way. No matter how hard I study for my test, I'm still going to fail it. Okay, so 
and often that leads to a self-fulfilling prophecy where you think if I don't study, I'm not going to, if I study, I'm going to pass. So you don't study. So you don't pass. And it confirms your belief. The internal locus control means that our actions and behaviors can change the outcome of a situation. And really where you want to be is in that internal locus of control, because a lot of our actions will dictate outcomes. Self-control is that idea of being able to put off rewards or being able to put off, um, you know, basic needs in the future. Here's a couple examples. We've got David Blaine down here who put himself in, in a block of ice in Times Square in New York and spent hours in there and was able to survive, which is obviously very extreme. And here we've got one of those these uh, people acting like statues, you know, just standing there doing nothing, ignoring the environment around them. Okay, so in module 30, we're going to look at observational learning, which is the, the third type of learning we're going to pay attention to. Fourth, I guess, if you count cognitive. So observational learning is just learning by watching others. We also call this social learning. Modeling is the action of showing a behavior and copying that behavior of someone else. Now, Bandura's Bobo doll experiment, experiment is a very, it's a classic. Okay, and Bandura is a highly respected uh, psychologist, uh, probably one of the most respected of his time. Um, and this is one of the, the big experiments that we that we know about. So what he did is he exposed children to a model. Okay, and the model that had a Bobo doll, which is a big doll, you can blow up and you punch it and it comes back up so you can punch it again. So they had the kids view this model and doing, you know, antisocial type of behavior, beating it, kicking it, throwing it, using aggressive language. And then he put the children into a room and children that were exposed to this model ignored many other toys that they could have gone and played with in a more passive way and chose the Bobo doll. And what they found is they mimicked that adult's behavior. They punched, they kicked, they throw. They actually found out novel ways to be aggressive with it, like hitting it with toys and, and so on. And the ones that were not exposed to the to the model being aggressive didn't play that way okay so this kind of shows that you know it leads to the question you know like does television viewing television stuff make us violent because there's so much violence we see on television movies um video games and such um and the answer is yes it definitely contributes to it uh we look at when television was introduced into the united states and canada that the violent crime rates tripled or doubled or tripled um, during that time. And a lot of it had to do with learning. Now, this does not mean because you watch, play video, violent video games or watch violent programming that you're going to be a violent person. Uh, there are many other factors that go with it. Now, these are correlations, obviously. We can't say it's a cause, but to ignore this as a fact in violent behavior or an aspect of violent behavior would be foolish. And part of the things when we're watching is... Uh, what have been discovered, we call them mirror neurons in the frontal lobe. And these are locations that will um, be activated while you're watching somebody do something. You know, you ever wonder why, why do we wa like watching people do things? And a lot of it is your brain with these mirror neurons think that you're actually doing the activity yourself. Um, they also lead to, you can be um, have empathy towards others, you know, a feeling of, of what they're feeling. And so they're, they're on the cutting edge kind of of neuroscience, and we're learning more about these mirror neurons as we go here. But there's definitely imitation that happens. We see animals, you know, copy other animals. Little babies will copy adults. You can see in the bottom there, this picture here where the little baby looks the same direction as the adult across from him, and they'll mimic all kinds of things. Um, and, and you can, you know, in experiments that we've done, we find, you know, like... Um, using a feather to rub the top of a jar before we open it. Little children then start to use a feather to rub the top of the jar before they open it. So they do learn a lot from imitation. And modeling violence happens, you know, that we, we like we were saying, it definitely leads to aggressive behavior. I'm sure many of you can think when you're a child that you mimic stuff that you saw on TV. You know, you played games uh, that were like some of your heroes that you saw. Um, very common for little people to, you know, watch uh, the World Wrestling Associate, what is it, Federation. And, you know, they go and copy their moves. Um, I know when I was little, I loved Batman. And I thought I could fly because he could. 
or Superman, sorry, because he could fly. And I remember going on top of my garage roof with a, a cape. It was just a blanket on my shoulder. and Thought I could jump off the garage and fly and be happy. Nope, I hit the ground real hard. Learned that maybe what's on TV isn't really real. So when we look at, you know, a lot of these things we're talking about violence, these are antisocial effects, things that go against, you know, uh, being caring, um, helpful people. But pro-social effects also happen. So models modeling pro-social act. Um, activities also children mimic that and that's why it's important a lot of times you know we we do mimic things for or we do model behaviors that are appropriate for younger people the uh um you know if you ask ask your parents or ask somebody you know who was their model when you know who their role model when they were growing up who's your role model and we find a lot of times it's people that are you know more similar to us that we choose as the role models you know, if you're an athlete, you're going to probably have an athlete as a role model. Okay, but so the good news is pro-social effects can be modeled as well. And that is the end of our learning unit. Make sure you study it up, and we'll see you folks in class real soon. Bye for now.